the American International University, West Africa. I'm not trying. But also take the opportunity to welcome you to such a historic event that we're expecting to host here today. We are all aware of some of the sacrifices that were made leading up to the elections of December 1st, 2016, and that also saw the coming together of seven political parties and one independent to form a coalition that we refer to as Coalition 20. Today, we intend to interrogate the successes, failures, and lessons that we may have learned out of Coalition 2016. We are well aware that this is an election year, and uh, we've seen through social media a lot of people, in fact, the need. So there will be opportunities for other debates that will be focused on current day matters. Today our focus will be on Coalition 2016. The challenge, challenger, Dr. Ismaila Sise of uh, Flag Bearer for Citizens Alliance Political Party, that all members or members of the Coalition 2016 have failed and in fact betrayed the expectations of Gambians. He would be in a better position to make that argument. But the House rules today are simple. Each of them, beginning with Dr. Ismail Assise, will have 15 minutes to argue their point. At the end of the 15 minutes, each of them will answer questions for two minutes. Each of them can also borrow two minutes three times. Sometimes you are in the middle of an answer the two minutes is exhausted, but the answer is not quite complete. So they can borrow two minutes, but only three times during the debate. If they say I borrow two minutes, that means they'll have an extension of two minutes, once, twice, and three times to the end. And we'd like to thank Saul Fraser of Global Properties, but also thank the media in Gambia. When we said, given two days, every media house in Gambia is here present today. And this, I think, is the way forward. Dr. Ismail Assise, we will begin with you, with your first 15 minutes. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, Karuna. Uh, thank you for hosting this very important discussion on the successes and failures of coalition 2016 and mapping a way forward. I also take this opportunity to thank all media houses present here today, but also equally extend uh, sincere gratitude to Honorable Halifa Salah for accepting the invitation and willing to join this discussion. I don't think there is any better person than the Honorable to come and discuss and diagnose with precision the coalition. I think everybody knows that Honorable is the architect of the coalition, so I thank him for that. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank him for his leadership during that very difficult period we call the impasse by instilling hope and holding the fort for the runaway president. Today we are here today to discuss the coalition 2016. I think this is important. The political season has started. In 2016, after many attempts, Political parties came together to pull their resources and their energy and their knowledge and their political capital to play the qualifying rounds. They qualified but could not make it to the final to win the trophy. 
So therefore, it's important to know why. So that, because every Gambian, most Gambians, sorry, are talking about possible coalitions. It's important to know why the 2016 coalition failed. So we can learn lessons and avoid such mistakes in the future. Note that this is not a competition. This is an exchange of ideas. Both myself and the Honorable will learn from each other. And I believe the public watching from home will also learn from us. We will leave this hall today with no victors. I will not be a victor. I will not be vanquished. The Honorable will not be victor or vanquished. But I think every Gambian will be victor today after this event. Political parties should nurture the culture of what I call the four C's. To coexist, to consult, to cooperate, and to challenge. But when they challenge, they challenge each other on the basis of the exchange of ideas, ideas that can help transform this country. This gives voters the opportunity to weigh different solutions to the country's very many complex problems and make informed choices at the polls. So I hope this will be seen as the first of many to take place in this country. I, for one, will not vote for any party whose leader doesn't want to come and face Gambians to tell us how you want to govern the country if you are entrusted. There will be no job for you if you don't want to come for an interview. Ladies and gentlemen, in 2016, in fact, before I go further, I'd like to thank all coalition members, not only the Honorable, for forming a united front in 2016. Their efforts paid somehow because we are here today in this hall to debate Gambian politics because of the sacrifices they made. So I thank you to all the coalition members. In 2016, opposition parties put their differences aside. They came together and formed a united front to remove Jame and initiate reforms that could put this country on a path towards democracy and development, in particular consolidate democracy and also promote the rule of law. To succeed and to achieve their goals, the coalition produced a manifesto promising to implement corrective programs of activities that were very appealing. But even though the coalition succeeded in removing President Jame, it is my argument that the second task, which is the most important, was shortcoming and it was a failure. That is, the agenda, as published in the coalition manifesto, and the reforms they promised to do, they were not successful in doing that. It is also my contention that this was a collective failure of the coalition members. The coalition established two documents. I think when you do some research, you'll realize perhaps it's three. That's what they call a draft MOU, which was not signed. And once it's not signed, it's just a draft, it's just a memorandum. I don't know whether we can call it a memorandum of understanding. I think Honorable can help us with that. That's also called what they call the 17th October Agreement, which was signed obviously, but also that's what they call the coalition manifesto. This was in line, or these instruments, these documents, were established for two purposes, or to help the coalition achieve its two purposes. The first one was what? To change government through peaceful means. And the second one was to create an enabling environment for elections in a free and fair playing field. So what happened to the argument? 
the agreement was fragile from the beginning. For example, there were fundamental provisions in the agreement which states that the person who will be elected as the flag bearer will resign from his or her party. The second one was that the person to be elected will give a commitment to serve for only three years and then step down to resignation, after which we will hold elections where she or he will not contest. However, the coalition members did not anticipate a potential breach of agreement and therefore could not create clear statutory or other legal mechanisms to ensure the terms of the agreement were enforceable. Now, the honorable members also did not test the courts to test the limits of our judicial system like Sid Mati and uh, his colleagues are doing to take Barrow to court for a breach of agreement. Because for me, the agreement was legally binding. It's a written contract and it's valid and therefore enforceable. It means that when parties sign a written contract, they are expected to fulfill their obligations under it. Now, for a written agreement to be legally binding, it must contain an accept terms of the contract terms in the document, the most common way to achieve this is through a signature. And as far as I know, and as far as I am concerned, and the Honorable can attest to that, President Adam Aboro, with three other coalition candidates, those who contested it in the, in, the, in the convention, signed this agreement. I read a press release by the DOI, uh, the party DOI, on 9 October 2019, which states that, I quote, the strategic objective was to, that is of the coalition, the strategic objective of the coalition was to put an end to self-perpetuating rule by the voluntary acceptance of the coalition sponsored candidate to serve a three-year term and preside over a free and fair election in which he or she would not participate or give support to any candidate. Can you please underline in bold, voluntary? Uh, Doi is saying that the objective was to put an end to self perpetuating rule by a voluntary acceptance of the person who was going to be elected as the flag bearer. Now, why sign an agreement where compliance is voluntary. That's why I've been a gentleman's agreement. In order to sign an agreement, if compliance is voluntary, and that is my argument. In fact, another top coalition member was quoted to say on April 5th that the agreement was a gentleman's agreement, which I also think that was in the case because the agreement was signed. It means that you give your consent that you will fulfill the obligations of the agreement. Let me hasten to note that nothing was wrong with this clause in the Constitution. That the person to be elected as the flag bearer should resign after three years. Nothing is wrong with that. Because why? As in section 63 of the Constitution, it provides for a five year Term, while section 65 of the same constitution provides for the resignation of the end before the end of the five year term. So even though you are elected for five years, there is nothing wrong in you resigning after two weeks or after five years or after three years. So nothing, nothing was wrong with that provision in the agreement. But it was also the responsibility of the coalition members to hold that person to account. But as we all know, no attempt was made by coalition partners, either individually or collectively, 
to hold him for account for breach of contract or for breach of agreement. Let's briefly look at the agenda. Because removing the incumbent was one goal. The most difficult and most important was to govern, to change this country, change institutions, reform the institutions. In the coalition manifesto, promises were made. They call it the agenda. The agenda was published, and reforms were promised to be implemented on issues such as education, health, governance, economic reforms, human rights, and justice. Now, some of the promises made in the agenda that were seen to be fundamental for the democratization process were not fully implemented. I'll give examples. Number one, the agenda promised that they will establish a body of jurists and competent personalities to review the Constitution with a view to cleansing it of all provisions which are inimical to democracy and the rule of law. What we saw was not that. What we saw was wholesale change of a constitution by spending $116 million and it didn't get anywhere. But I would also like to give credit to Honorable who raised this issue in Parliament, but he wasn't listened to. The other promise was that in June with section 39 of the 97th Constitution, two also minutes, section Dr. 11, two minutes. Two minutes to go. Yeah. Of the 15 minutes? Yes, sir. Okay, can I borrow my two minutes then? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can borrow your first two minutes now. Yes, yeah, so okay, then I'll have to move. But that was an agenda which promised to do certain things. Now let's come to the, why I think the coalition failed to implement um, the promises they made. One was leadership. The leadership that was provi provided during the impasse was not matched when it was needed after the impasse. What we saw was that the architect of the coalition, which is the Honorable, he kind of laid back a bit and that left the coalition void of leadership. And I think every Gambian wants to, if you know, I take this opportunity to ask Honorable whether he was offered any cabinet post. I think we all want to know that. But also, if he was offered, why didn't he take it? Why did he opt to go to assembly instead of cabinet? Also, I think the coalition failed to defend the coalition, the coalition members. Why? Because the coalition was undermined by a few people. I'll give examples. One prominent member was in Dakar and said that he had sacked one, another prominent member who was the spokesperson. He was sacked as the spokesperson. The other one was what? Another prominent member said that the president should go for five days instead of three, and anybody who doesn't like it should go to the courts, and that was not defended by the coalition members. But also, when the first victim of the president, that is, the minister of interior, was sacked by the president, the coalition members did not challenge the president to say you are violating the principles of the coalition, which is that you must appoint all five ministers in consultation into the board of two minutes now, sir. Constitutional um, executive, a coalition executive committee. Um, but that wasn't even set up, and there was also no uh, secretariat. So that was also a problem that happened as well. So the coalition was not defended. So we could see from the onset that there were power struggles within the coalition as well. Also, if we were a part of the coalition, that I would have, we would have had the foresight to plan for a legislative governance framework, which, were, which was not there. And it's brought the argument of tactical alliance and coalition alliance, which rendered parliament almost um, in a state whereby it was highly polarized. And today we saw what happened. And the, one of the victims was the constitution. So finally, every Gambian put their trust in the coalition to change this country. That is why we voted. We exchanged our votes for the promise they gave us. And then every government also took part and helped the coalition that led the crusade. Therefore, collectively, we applaud them. But in my opinion, they failed to finish the job, a job that they promised to the Gambian people, and failed to defend and promote the interest of the coalition and oversights and mistakes led to monumental failures with far-reaching consequences for our democracy. They failed to replace the bad system 
they sought to change with a better one, and all the reforms that they promised did not, either were not initiated or they failed. And all members are responsible for this failure in my argument. To move on and to have trust from the population, I think members should acknowledge that there were shortcomings, accept it, accept the weaknesses, take collective responsibility. That is what leaders do. When there is success, they give credit. When there is failure or weakness, Time, they come Cesar. out and take responsibility. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ismaila Sise, Citizens Alliance Political Party. Uh, now, Honorable Halifa Sala will have an opportunity to respond in his view uh, if, in fact, Coalition 2016 have failed the Gambian people or was the success it was designed to be. Honorable Sala, the floor is yours. Every analysis must take context into consideration. You must have the point at issue, interrogate it, gather the evidence in order to pass judgment. Unfortunately, and maybe the Honorable Dr. Sisi will clear that point. I don't think he has ever read even the coalition agreement. I may be wrong. But his premise will either indicate that he has not read it or does not want to fully explain its essence. The context. Here is a document called Opposition Parties' Proposals and Demands for Electoral and Constitutional Reform in the Gambia, 7 April 2015. This was sent to the President, to ECOWAS, to all international organizations. After that, on the 20th of July, 2015, the executive came with this act to amend the Elections Act. And Section 43 decided to increase the deficit so 500,000 from 10,000 for presidential candidate, 50,000 against 5,000 for National Assembly members, 50,000 against 2,500 for mayors and chairpersons, and then 10,000 against 1,250 for councils. 48 constituencies multiplied by the 50,000, you can see that there was a deliberate attempt to make it impossible for the opposition to survive. And I will not mention the other additives. So the response of the executive was that it will not engage in electoral reform. What followed? All of you are witnesses to what Doi proposed in 2015 if proper research has been done. We indicated in our agenda 2016, published in 2015, and here I will be willing to give it to Honorable Dr. Sisi, where it talks about strategy for 2016. The agenda analyzed that it was the deliberate attempt of the government to frustrate the opposition. And the opposition responded in 2012 by not participating 
in the elections, National Assembly elections, unless there was electoral reform. The presidential election indicated very clearly that the opposition could not remove the government from office by each political party being on its own. The result, 17% for UDP, 11% for the United Front. That was the result of the presidential election. The vote of the UDP was declining. Of course, the United Front was rising, but together is just 27%, which is what the UDP had in the 2006 presidential election. So we saw electoral reform to be absolute must. We called for it. We refused to participate unless it was done in 2012. And Doi analyzed the results of the 2012 National Assembly elections, where you had 48 seats, only 23 seats were contested. And out of those seats, you had result 80,000 for the APRC and 60,000 for the independent. Plus the 14,000 NRP, you had only a difference of less than 7,000. Showing that the APRC, regarding the popular vote, did not have that full control of the population. Especially when we took into consideration that over 790 something thousand were supposed to participate, only 23 constituencies participated, numbering about 300 and something thousand, and out of those 300 and something thousand, only 150 something thousand participated in the National Assembly elections. We had five people who were not APRC, four independent, one NRP. So moving forward, do I analyze that if we are to participate in the 2016 election, we must insist on electoral reform, failing which we must build a coalition. So essentially, that is history. Now, looking at the coalition, in September, I was elected as a presidential candidate. We saw the temperature. The leader of the UDP was in prison. Gambians abroad felt that there was no way of changing this country except to overthrow the government. The government had decided that it is the power of the state that will protect it because as far as electoral contest was concerned, it was going to win, hands down. It was not threatened by any opposition. The temperature was rising. And they saw the need to implement its tactical objective to try to build a coalition. I convened a meeting at Kairaba Hotel deliberately because any other place the government was suspicious of meetings of the opposition. And it would have been very easy wherever the opposition met to say, well, they are preparing for something else other than election because the person who was in power never believed that no right-thinking opposition would ever think that you can remove him through the ballot box. I knew very clearly that he will know everything that is happening at Kairaba. And by virtue of that, he will simply say, well, these people, leave them. That was the actualist hill. Leave them. And we met. The beginning was not a coalition of parties. It was a coalition of the presidential candidates and then involved their parties. Six presidential candidates were ready to participate. For the sake of time, we all know them. We convened the meeting. Only two sent the presidential candidates. The rest sent their representatives. For two weeks, the discussion continued. Until we saw an opening. Eventually, a group calling itself Interparty Committee met me 
and indicated that, well, they were interested in what was happening at Kairaka. It was very clear then that they could also be incorporated in the discussion. Another woman, I do not need to mention name, also had always been writing to the opposition parties for coalition. We saw the need to involve the woman in the second phase. And finally, I contacted Honorable Dembo Boya to emphasize the need for the organization we have established, the opposition, the opposition parties for, for, for GOFA, that is the opposition parties for electoral reform. Opposition parties for electoral reform go far to convene a meeting of all the members so that we can start the process of coalition building. That was done. We had these independent civil society representatives to participate. But ultimately, the answer to your question is this. The coalition started the process of being built on the 14th of October. We met on the 17th to prepare the agreement. You will question me about the agreement. I will show you what is there. All it mentioned is that we agree to put the past behind us and come together to be able to have delegates, 10 representatives, in order to have a coalition building process. What was mentioned in the agreement is that we will have a committee on good governance, committee on national convention, committee on democracy and rule of law, committee on justice and human rights. We had committees. The committees met, made recommendations. We adopted the recommendation. These three years that you've mentioned became part of those recommendations. We participated in elections with the view to prevent the deterioration of the peace of the country. Insults everywhere. Attacks everywhere. Gambia was in flames. We all know it. So the purpose of the coalition was to ensure that we bring about the change that will prevent Gambia from disintegration. That was the fundamental objective. The other objectives are collateral objectives. But the key objective was to ensure that we prevent Gambia from disintegration. And that succeeded. On the 30th of October, we selected a presidential candidate. I was a presidential aspirant. Why did I accept? Because failure to accept, the incumbent would have still been there. That would not have been a way of attaining our objectives. We decided to campaign on a platform of one Gambia, one nation, one people. And the coalition succeeded before the vast majority of people even knew what was in a manifesto. The Gambian people supported the coalition because they were convinced that where Gambia was heading would lead to disintegration. Two minutes, Honorable Sala. So in that respect, if we look at context, there is not a single Gambian here who would say that before October 30th, he or she believed that change will come through the ballot box on the 1st of December 9, uh, 2016. Not a single Gambian other than those who had the tactical objectives of building a coalition. So I must say that in that respect, for the country to change through the ballot box for the first time in its history, 52 years of history, nobody can say that the coalition did not attain the objective for which it was established. Now we must go and through the question that will be asked into the context of nation building after the victory. Why did it take the shape that it did? 25th of December, prior to taking over on the 19th. We established the fact that 
the constitutional legitimacy was the primary objective to be defended. Electoral legitimacy, primary objective to be defended. We defended that through the impasse and stabilized the country and ensure a change of power through peaceful means. That is the second attainment of the strategic objective of the coalition, to ensure transfer of power through peaceful means. On the 19th, the president assumed office. On the 24th... Time, Honorable. Can I borrow two minutes and conclude? Yes, you can borrow your first two minutes as well. So in that sense, then, we have seen that trajectory of a country changing without any looting, without any killing, without any war, no invasion by economic. They were received as forces of solidarity rather than force of invasion, as we have seen in 1981. Who on earth would say that the coalition failed in that respect? So all the objectives for which the coalition was established were actually attained. And finally, we had to go to the second stage where the coalition needed another memorandum of understanding which it never signed. If you want to know why it wasn't signed, and the implications, the contradiction within the coalition, I believe that is what we are here to interrogate. But as far as fundamental objective is concerned, the coalition led the Gambia to change office to the ballot box in peace. Thank you very much, Honorable Salah. <clears throat> we have uh, gone through the first part um, I like to introduce Keba Kamara of Keba Kacha and uh, Keba Kamara Kabefo so that uh, members of the press here present, please, you can go through Keba because he will be moderating the question and answer. Not yet, sir, not yet, but he'll be moderating the question and answer session with the press. So, Adama, please provide him a microphone as well. Um, but I think it is only fair that I give five minutes each so they react to each other's uh, deliberations. Would this be fair, Honorable Salam? Doctor? Okay, so I'll give you the first five minutes to react to his deliberations, and then we'll have him also five minutes to yours. Now, it is no surprise that I did not read the, read the coalition agreement because the coalition agreement, even those who signed it, don't have access to it. One of the failures of the coalition is that they fail to ensure that they make enough co copies so that every signatory has his or her own copy. And it's nowhere to be found online. The only thing online is a draft, like I said, a draft, MOU. If you read Dois Gonga, the specific objectives of the coalition are clearly stated that it is two phases. So I disagree that it's has achieved its goal by, peace, by initiating peaceful change, but not going further to create an enabling environment for an election in a level playing field. That is not going to happen this election. We still have a president in State House who is still using the power of incumbency there is no new constitution, no new electoral laws, no new civil service reform, no security sector reform. So how can we call that success? Yes, they've achieved one goal, getting into the tournament by qualifying through the primaries, but failed to do good, to try and get to the finals and win the trophy. So what does that mean? They have to go back to relegation and start again and remove another incumbent who is using the same instruments, the same institutions, the same laws as the predecessor. So for me, that is not success. Um, 
honorable also, it seems like he agrees with me to some extent that they have failed in the sense that he did not counter any of my arguments. Instead, what he did was to give context, 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 context which we know already, we all know what happened. And like I said, we thank the coalition for that, but I still maintain my position that they still did not succeed in what they sought to do. Two minutes, Dr. Sisi. Before I conclude, I still like to reiterate my question to Honorable, that every Gambian wants to know, because there is so much misconception out there, the Honorable was offered a cabinet post, and he rejected. There are those who are saying, no, he wasn't offered. I think it would be fair for the Honorable to himself tell us whether he was offered a cabinet post or not. And if he was offered, why didn't he take it? And if he was not an, an opted to go to uh, the National Assembly, um, I think I really want the Honorable to answer that question for me. Thank you. Okay, I'll start with the question and then uh, analyze further. Five I have minutes. said that the coalition must be examined in context. We've seen the fundamental objective. We are looking at the secondary objectives. The secondary objectives emerge from the recommendations of the committees. Let me just give you an example. The Committee on Good Governance indicated that the criteria on the tenure of the office of the flag bearer, that's why it said that the flag bearer shall head a transitional government for a period of three years. The transitional president shall be open, transparent, and accountable to all during the transition. The transitional president shall respect the views and rights of the citizens. The transitional president shall not support any party during the transition period. The transitional president shall not seek for the election until after the five years after the transitional period. The transitional leader must be a unifier, good listener, team player, and easily accessible person. Each contestant shall make pledges to respect and uphold all the conditions circumscribing his or her tenure as established by the coalition. So you can see that the coalition was being weaved in progress. Imagine meeting on the 17th of October on, and drafting all these documents. And on the 38th, within two weeks, you held a convention. From 38 October to 38 November, one month. 38 November to 1st December, one day. Within one month, two days, you change power that was mightier than any power ever established in the Gambia. So you can see the sequence of events. And therefore, these what you saw here, or what you see here as recommendation, should and were incorporated in what you call a draft. There's nothing like a draft document. Something was prepared for us to consider. It was never considered. And all this were incorporated in it. And that should have guided the second process. That second process is executive power situated in the Constitution. And that executive power has absolute authority to appoint ministers, to remove ministers, whilst the governance established by the coalition would have required consultation with the coalition. You'll be able to get these documents later so that you see what was prepared to guide the implementation of any recommendation made by the coalition at the level of executive power once it assumes responsibility. You've asked me the question, was I offered? Two on the 25th, yes, on the 25th of December, you've had the president make a statement indicating that we were going to establish an agency for sustainable socioeconomic development. The agency will establish an expert bank. And all Gambians will send their curriculum vitae, which they did. Many did. And from the expert bank, will create 
clusters of experts on all issues of national development. And they will make their recommendation, short, medium, long-term recommendation, before the president assumes office as a start. And those ministers who will eventually be appointed will rely on those documents to start the process of governance. I volunteered to head that agency. The documents were given to some members of the coalition to vet. Eventually, we had a consulted pristine consultancy. Go and ask the gentleman to prepare the template to create the database for all Gambians and anybody else in the world who would wish to be part of that expert bank. Did that happen? All became chaff in the wind. So do we Time say Salah, that is the failure of a coalition? Is the failure of the executive assuming office and beginning to run a government like a normal government? Eventually, it was not a coalition government that came into being. It's the executive presidency that came thank into you, being. Thank you, Honorable. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen. I, I think the media is ready, but I'd like to fire a few questions to set the ball rolling. And I'd also like to propose, as many have also asked, that at the end, each of you may choose a local language for closing remarks, perhaps use it to summarize, if you may. Honorable Sala, is this uh, reasonable, doctor? It's reasonable. Maybe five to 10 minutes in the end, so somebody will speak a Wolof or a Mandinka somewhere, so that we'll carry the general public along. Uh, doctor Cisse, my first question to you is, a dictatorship ended by the coming together of these political parties. We've seen the setting up of commissions. We've seen the National Human Rights Commission. We've seen the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We've seen reforms and change. And in fact, media freedom, proliferation of political parties. Will you not attribute all of these to success of coalition 2016? If well, yes, yes. If no, two minutes. Well, no to some extent. No, to some extent. The TRRC is yet to be ready. We are waiting. If the TRRC's recommendations are not fully implemented, it has failed. The Janet Commission's recommendations are not been fully implemented. There is still fiscal indiscipline in this country. They suggested and recommended for 28 people to be expunged from the civil service. For taking part in sleaze, they are still serving in government. So therefore, the selective manner of the implementation of the Janet Commission. And also, the things that the Janet Commission recommended have not been implemented, so that's, not, that's a failure. As we saw recently, uh, when we received this so-called COVID organics from Guinea-Bissau, a government official went to the central bank to withdraw 2.1 million from the counter. And the statutory limit was to be $100,000, so it means that for that, that has failed. Media freedom, it's the media that fought for it. Gambians voted. The coalition cannot take credit. That is why I think leadership has failed in the coalition. Let them come out and take responsibility as well, so that we know that, to be honest, you know, they've taken responsibility, it has failed. But to be honest, I don't attribute the freedom to the coalition. Gambians came out to vote, and they voted out the dictator. And it was not only the success of the coalition, it is the success of every Gambian. So I wouldn't attribute that success to the coalition. Thank you very much, Dr. Honorable Sala. A lot of fingers are pointed in your direction to say, you designed such a beautiful document, the coming together, unbelievable, that this was possible. You guided, you molded, you've written, you've spoken, you've calmed the public, you participated, only to withdraw your support and participation after winning. That, in fact, many say, is the reason why it's not fully implemented, the objectives have not been uh, attained because of your lack of participation yourself. Yes, no, two minutes. Well, I believe uh, we have, must distinguish before you establish a government and after you establish a government. The coalition is pre-government and post-government. I have made it very clear 
that the coalition ceased to exist once executive power was assumed. You started to have a normal government. That is the reality. And when you have a normal government, the president will consult, the UDP will consult all the other parties, PPP, etc. Et I'm offering you this ministerial post. If they accept, then that becomes their post. Then to look into all the provinces, people with the expertise, and appoint them as ministers. That's executive presidency. I will not take account for anything that went wrong after the assumption of office. Because nobody consulted me on how to run a government after that. That is the point. <laughs> secondly, secondly, we assumed as doi that we could move into a coalition trajectory by having a national assembly which was coalition national assembly. But that didn't happen. And I must ask Dr. Caesar and all the other people who say, talked about the failure, why didn't they stand for National Assembly elections? It was open to every Gambian to go and stand and be a National Assembly member because the coalition did not exist anymore. We did not participate as coalition members in the National Assembly election. Every single Gambian could have participated. Why did you not participate to save this country? Time. To give clout to the National Assembly. You want to borrow a second two minutes? Two minutes, yes. Go ahead. So in essence, it is easy to indict, but it's very difficult to assume responsibility. I did not run away. I saw what was happening. I knew what I could do and what I could not do. And I continued to assist the president to the best of my ability in the decision-making process until it was time to go and contest for a National Assembly seat, and I went and contested because I knew that in that National Assembly, this is where we are going to serve as oversight to continue to expose what is wrong and show what is right. It is now left to the executive to accept what is right and abandon what is wrong. Failing which I can now stand and say, this is an executive that needs to be changed. And I will have the moral authority to say that. Now I have moral authority to say, this executive needs to be changed. There is need for system change. And nobody can question me. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Salah. Uh, Dr. Ismaila, everybody, well, not everybody, I'm exaggerating here. A few people had said, well, Dr. Ismail Assisi himself is a product of the success of the coalition 2016. He's standing here today as head of a political party, which may not have existed if Jame were still president. What do you say to that two minutes? Uh, how many parties were registered when Jame was in power? A few. GPDP was registered when Jame was in power. GMC was registered when Jame was in power. So Jame's being in power did not inhibit anyone from registering a political party. Even if Jame was in power post-2016 and CA wanted to register a political party and follow the procedures, I think we would have still registered a political party. So that excuse, that rationale, that argument is really weak because there is evidence that parties were registered when Jame was in power. That's it. Uh, Honorable Salah, I, um, a lot of people also are saying, I'm sharing a lot of opinion here today, of course, uh, that if you had any opportunity now, you, and by extension, DOI, may not consider uh, coming together with other parties as a result of the failure and disappointment that you may have experienced in 2016. Yes, no, two minutes. 2006, I was made a lot coalition candidates. Upper Salum, Lower Salum was supposed to be handled by some of the NAT members. One went to the UK, the other, after we fixed his transport, decided to move to the APRC. So if it is just sabotaging the progress of DOI, that should have been the end. But in 2011, we supported the United Front. 
and had 11% of the vote to the UDP 17%. And some are saying, well, it is the UDP who enabled the coalition to win. But here, 2011, 17%, 11% for the United Front, and rising. So essentially, in 2016, if you follow how the elections went for the candidate, I could have protested. You've heard all the coalition leaders saying, Dr. Sisi is saying that, yes, a party has been registered, but where was the GMC leader when we were establishing the coalition? Where was the GPDP leader when we were establishing the coalition? All had left the country. This was not a safe ground for genuine multi-party contest. That is the reality. Let's accept that fact. The coalition has changed, has shifted. You see, development is not always planned. Sometimes it can be spontaneous. Sometimes it can be incidental. What is incidental to the change is not the plan that some of us had. But today you have a judiciary that can stand and say, this independent National Assembly member has been removed by the ex executive. Go back to the National Assembly. That is the progress that the country has made. For a civil society organization to say, 54 million, you have not done it according to the Constitution. To be caught, removed. That's what we should take into consideration, that because of the environment that has been created, Gambia has indeed changed. But it's not necessarily a change of system. Time, sir. We must now move to the next change. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ismail Asisa, my last question to you, and I'll have a last final question to Honorable Salah before we go to Keba and uh, media here. 2021, December is around the corner. Will you, via Citizens Alliance, consider coming together with other like-minded political parties, seemingly 20 presidential candidates or more? We have 18 uh, registered. We have two, three, four uh, independents considering. Are you imagining forming some sort of an alliance, some sort of a coalition for 2021? Well, we at CA don't believe in forming alliances just to remove an incumbent. We believe in being part of alliances that will bring change, sustainable change. Um, removing the incumbent is one job, like I've said. Changing is another. So we'll have to consider those things. We, the agenda must be right and genuine. The framework must be right. Policies and platforms and visions must align, then maybe perhaps we can start discussions. But for now, we will not engage or take part in any coalition just for the sake of changing the incumbent and replacing that incumbent with another incumbent, and yet there will be no sustainable development or change in this country. Thank you. Honorable Salah. You talk very personally about system change, system change, system change. What is system change? And can you bring us system change? Two minutes. We've seen that uh, sovereignty resides in the people of the Gambia. But look at our division into ethno-linguistic groups, into religious groups, into all sectors of society. That is what we intend to change to unify the Gambian nation so that we know that sovereignty resides in each of us and collectively we must exercise that power to control the resources of the land in order to eradicate poverty, eradicate injustice, eradicate ignorance. The ocean belongs to us. Look at Batokon Kusanya and Kato. They are mining. First Republic is like Gambia, it's just a ground-up country, nothing is here. Second Republic, they discovered that. But they were mining and selling, and nobody knew <laughs> what they were doing with it. Current situation, license, and you take control of what belongs to the Gambian people. We are saying system change means that what is there, the minerals belong to the people. If you are going to give a percent, maybe 10%, but the 90% or more must be owned by the people, you will take that, put it in a central bank, into a cooperative fund, which you can now utilize to provide that child who comes from, from GTTI 
and has no means of production, you will say, here is what you can use to go and mill the coups, provide some form of processing. That is what we are talking about. You will utilize that to give it to the farmer, where you'll have the seed, fertilizer, and farming implement for the farmer, and they will pay back into the cooperative bank exactly what you've given them. It's a revolving fund. We are saying that you move to the person who also want to buy those goods to market, so that in doing so, you prove the cooperative bank will give them with the means to be able to do the purchasing so that they'll be able to sell. We believe that that process will create a Gambia owned by the people, resources owned by, by us. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I hand over the button to Keba Kamara to coordinate with the media. Uh, everyone can ask a direct question, not longer than a minute, not more than a question. And then you can ask a direct question. First question must be addressed to Dr. Sise. Second, to Honorable Sala. And we will do it that way. We will not repeat or continue to ask one participant. So we'll pass the button, ping pong, to each. So first question must be addressed to Dr. Sise. We've, thank you very much, Mr. Drame. We've also seen some party militants here. I'm not sure whether they are allowed to ask questions. Uh, absolutely. I think everybody here should be able to. But let's prioritize media. It's a media event. <laughs> Each media house, one question. Uh, yes, sir. So for not now. Be more than one minute. Yes. Rose, and not you. more than a question. And thank must you. be addressed to Ismail Asise for the first one. Thank you. Ke Keba is coordinating. It's, it's his choice. <laughs> Second question. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Yankuba Jalo for a newspaper, sir. Um, sir, you have blamed, you have faulted the coalition for not taking steps to take the matter to court to enforce their agreement. When the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court, that, that the Supreme Law of the Land, the Constitution, does not provide any base to compel someone to resign. So, what would have been, why should the coalition take their agreement to court when the Supreme, the Supreme Court gives the president five year mandate? The five-year mandate is guaranteed by Section 65 of the Constitution, I believe, which says that the President has a mandate of five years. But the same Constitution, Section 63, also gives the President the latitude to resign anytime when he wants to resign, and that will not violate the Constitution. So the idea was that there was an agreement that was signed that became a contractual agreement. So therefore, I see no reason why that could have not been tested in the courts to see whether there was a breach of contract by the person who did breach the contract. That has nothing to do with the Supreme Court. It's very clear. If President Baru had decided to resign after the three years, serving for three years, he would not have violated the Constitution because there are provisions that you could resign as president. So I saw no reason why that could not have been tested in the courts. Thank you very much. Well, Dr. Sise, yeah, I am Abdullah Dabo. The question must be to Honorable Sal. Ah, okay, sorry. I am Abdullah Dabo from Paradise TV. My question to you, Doc, uh, Mr. Sala, is. The fact that the executive of the coalition failed to attain a certain goal or some of their goals, isn't it worth saying that the coalition failed in that aspect because almost all the coalition members were given an executive post? Honorable Salah, don't you see that there is a collective responsibility in this? Well, what I have said, the coalition was designed to remove a person from office. It succeeded in doing that to ensure a peaceful transfer of power. It succeeded in doing that. After that, we had recommendation as to what should happen. But that cannot be supreme because you have a constitution and the person who is elected would govern according to the constitution. I would come to agree with Dr. Sisi that we have not fouled the constitution because Section 65 does say that the person can resign, and that could be in two days or three, etc. I am emphasizing to you 
that my recommendation to establish an agency for sustainable socioeconomic development did not go very far prior to the assumption of office by the president. If that has not gone very far, what is the use of me assuming a ministerial post when I was recommending something much grander? Imagine an expert bank where all Gambians would have been involved in managing the affairs of this country. If that is rejected, what is there for me in a ministerial post? The president would not give me a ministerial post, would not offer me a ministerial post because I was his spokesperson. I had to demand for something. He would not know what I want. But I have to look at the situation and see what was going on. Would it have been more for me to demand from the president that give me the position of, of, of vice president? Many people were saying, this is the man who should be the vice president of the country. Would it have been moral for me to actually demand for that position? What position should I have de demanded for? What position should he have given me? I ask you people. But that president knows that my motive, which I declared to the Inspector General of Police when I went there after the victory, that the, president, uh, the incoming president is under threat. And you are the people who must defend the outgoing president and the incoming president. That for me, I told the inspector, you know, he's still alive. Thanks, that for sir. me, I have no vested interest because I will never be a minister in this government. Because I wanted moral authority. Thank you. Uh, does anyone have a question for Dr. Cisse? Ka, here. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. I would have loved uh, both uh, participants, but uh, Dr. C. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, my question is, um, both of you have made valid arguments, and I want to know what your opponent has said that you agree with. Well, apart from the fact that the first phase of the objective of the coalition had succeeded, that is, they were able to change government peacefully. I agree with that. Honorable Salah. I have seen a, an attempt for us to try to have a holistic view of coalition prior to assumption of office and coalition thereafter. I believe some facts are missing and with an analytical mind, if those facts are present, I believe the conclusion which Dr. Sisse made would not be made, that is a blanket allegation that all of us are responsible for what is happening now. I beg to differ in that regard. Oh, uh, thank you very much. I'm Salutal. <clears throat> I'm speaking here as a citizen, not as the president of the Bar Association. <clears throat> um, this question I would like to put to Honorable Salah. Okay. You may do too, but let's do doctor. It's okay, Dr. very well. Star. Very well. Um, the uh, doctor said that um, the um, coalition should have tested the courts by perhaps litigating over the um, breach or alleged breach of contract of the incumbent. Um, uh, Dr. Sisi, have you sought legal advice as to whether or not uh, an agreement of, of this manner is justiciable, given that there's a, the Constitution stipulates what the mandate is? And secondly, do you think that the collusion um, in coming to this ag agreement or recommendation, as the case may be, averted their mind 
to the constitutional provision and also what, what to do in the event that the incumbent does not resign. Thank you. I got confused with the second part of the question. The first one is very clear, but the second part I got to be confused. Okay, the second part is, did, did you, do you think that the coalition have addressed their mind to the possibility of the uh, flag bearer not agreeing to resign, and if so, what to do about it? Well, I would not be in the mind of the coalition members, so I cannot definitely answer that question, lest I'll be, um, I'll be making hypotheses that would I, I wouldn't want to do. But when it comes to the legal advice, yes, I spoke with a few lawyers to ask them about binding, whether signed agreements are legally binding. See, there are two levels here. There's a signed agreement, there's an agreement that was signed, that I, President Adam Abaro, agree to be part of this framework, and I agree that if I'm elected as flag bearer, I will resign from my political party, which he did, I will serve for three years transition, and I will resign and will not contest the elections after that. That is one. Now the Constitution is clear that the mandate of the President is five years. But the same Constitution gives the President also the privilege to resign at any time he so wishes. So for me, I see nothing wrong with the President resigning from power to fulfill an obligation that he himself signed. I believe that if I was president and I made a pledge, I made a commitment and I signed, and that's an obligation, I would have resigned to fulfill that pledge. Now, whether the Supreme Court would rule in favor of President Barrow or not, I wouldn't know, but for me it was, wouldn't have been bad to test the waters and stretch the limits and resilience of our judiciary. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Okay, but maybe we try to get two, three more. Two, three uh, more? Uh, yes. I mean, I see a few hands. You may ask two questions. As long as you direct a question to each, uh, I, I, I think this is possible. Um, thank you very much. Yusuf Taylor for Gainako News. Uh, my first question is to Halifa. Um, you made a very controversial statement once. Regime change. There is no system change. Doctor has highlighted that the second part was the most important part. My question to you, Honorable. Are you now saying that regime change, which brought through President Adama Barrow, is the ultimate success? My first question. Then to um, Doctor. We've seen Honorable Khalifa has run tried or attempted to run for president for a number of times and has not been successful, but he has gone into National Assembly. Will you be willing to do the same if the 2021 presidential elections are not successful for yourself? Will you be willing to do the same? Honorable so, Salah first. Correction, when you say I've stood a number of times, I don't think that is accurate. Uh, I wanted to stand for Doi in 2016, the only time that uh, I was nominated to stand for Doi, but you know what happened. I have never been a candidate of Doi, and Doi has only participated in three presidential uh, runs. And that was 1992, 1997, and 2001. Since that period, we have been promoting coalition building. You've mentioned that uh, I made a controversial statement. I don't know what is controversial about that. We see the poverty in the country. Go to the market now. What is the price of meat? What is the price of rice? What is the price of food? Is that system change? How many people? Over 500,000 young people come out of our school system every 12 years. What is the possibility for them to get work? Is that system change? I emphasize that the coalition was not designed to ensure system change. It is a transitional instrument to shape the constitution, state the institutions, carry out the reforms so that we have a foundation for a leap forward 
That was the objective. Even that objective has not been attained. My argument with Dr. Sisi is that he is putting the coalition as a continuous organ for government. I am saying there was discontinuity after the assumption of executive power. That's my argument. And that discontinuity must be seen to be responsible for what is happening here. And I am not part of that. That's my position. Dr. Cisse? Yes. What's the question? Uh, he said I didn't answer his question. Uh, uh, let's allow him to do a follow-up, just to be sure that the point is clear. Keva, yes. can we get to Flex? It's his right to get clarity. So we'll give two minutes My so that he's clear. It's simple. And the reason why I said it's controversial, the president picked it up, and it was a controversial issue. The question, are you now saying that regime change, which brought through President Adam Abaro, is successful? That's what I'm asking. That's precisely what I'm saying that you had Jammeh here, we removed him in peace. That's what I'm saying, that's successful. What bigger success is that? 52 years, your country had never changed through the ballot box. This, is the first, this was the first time in history for your country to change through the ballot box. You said that's not successful? That gave you a starting point. That's why the media is here today. You know what was happening during the impasse. My, my, my friend is here, M uh, Mr. Tal. He knows what happened. Gambia has decided what, what happened. No, it's not about what, you see, this is, this is the mediocrity. Who will stand against arms? It's not about running away. The issue is that there was a desire to emphasize the change that had occurred. But the might of the state was still in the hands of a transitional president. And we changed that. And he left in peace. And that is what we must appreciate. Uh, Dr. Sise, would you want a repeat of the question, or you're OK? No, I think the question is very clear. Go ahead. Uh, is that an assumption that if he doesn't win the election, yes. that whether I would be ready to go to the National Assembly well, I wouldn't be in a situation to make that decision now. Uh, my focus is on the presidential elections, and that is what I'm working towards. So I cannot be aiming for the Premier League and start thinking that re about relegation to the championship. So, so <laughs> how many more questions, Mr. Drami? How many uh, more questions? Uh, I, I think we still have time. So please, let's, let's uh, get a few more questions in. Greetings, everyone. I have a question for Dr. Ismail Sise. I see him giggling when Halifa make a statement about the Gonga, which is the economic corporate model of DOI. Um, Mr. Sala, Honorable Sala made it very clear that the public sector is the one mandated, according to their vision, to be the trustee of the wealth of the nation. And uh, through the corporate model, the public sector or the state would be responsible for the marine, terrestrial, and atmospheric resources of the state. Yes, very direct. Mm -hmm. I want to know if this corporate model of economic operation has been successful and could align with your economic model as a party, and what are the gaps in terms of differences? Thank you. So there are three questions, whether it has been successful, whether it aligns with our economic policy, and what else? Are the different. Obviously, I mean, the, the cooperative model has different variances, depending on the level of the, of, the, of the intervention of the state, whether it's cooperative is operating within a centrally planned economy or within the context of a free market economy. And if I understand the Dois Gonga, they are building a productive corporate base, which will be obviously facilitated 
by public enterprises. Therefore, I think the Honorable can correct me if I'm wrong. It's about the state, a centrally planned cooperative system. Where we differ is that we believe in the power of the private sector. We believe in the free market economy. Because we believe that the free market breeds competition, which breeds innovation and ingenuity, and therefore which helps the economy to thrive and create jobs. We believe that global capital is necessary because today we live in a hyper-economic world. The person who attracts, wills, and spends global capital wisely will be in a position to transform their societies in a very short period of time. So therefore, we don't mind having a cooperative system, but not within the framework of a centrally planned economy, but within the framework of a free market economy. That is what the differences are. So you could call CA, perhaps, uh, socialist-oriented, insofar as the distribution of national wealth is concerned, in accordance with the principles of fairness and solidarity. But how we generate that wealth? We want to create the enabling environment, get the right legal frameworks, build knowledge economy, build human capital, build infrastructure to attract wealth, diversify the economy from agriculture to services, to marine, and you name it, to tech, so that we provide jobs for our young people within the context of a Thank private you. sector that can thrive, that can create jobs, and that can also bring in wealth needed to invest You in may people. borrow two minutes if you like. I'm fine. You're fine. Okay. Then Keba? Okay. Uh, my question goes to Dr. Sise. Uh, Dr. Sise said he did not see the coalition uh, agreement. What, what, what I didn't want is happening now. I don't want all questions to be focused on one. Uh, do you have a question for Honorable Salah? If not, we'll go to somebody else and come back. I think, I think we've also broken the rules. Ah. The idea was well, that the media only will ask questions and not party militants. Oh, that's a party militant. Oh, okay. <laughs> so therefore... I, no, I, no, no, Haruna, I think you said party as far as everybody... Participants. Yeah, participants can also uh, ask. Yes, but, but the, the, the email was only media will ask questions, the press, and not party militants. Not party but, but I may not be able to identify who is a party well, militant. Well, they can introduce for themselves to say, I'm from this media house. Well, okay. when you say it's only media house, we can do that. We can control that. Uh, what are we going to do now? Wait, wait let's, but, ha let's but have so a... So many people ask questions here and they are not actually from media houses. Which has already happened. Which have already happened, yes. But, 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 may we, let's respect uh, his opinion of party militants not asking questions. Okay. So ordinary Gambians and media persons can ask questions. Perhaps. That's a problem as well. <laughs> How do we differentiate between party militants and ordinary Gambians? <laughs> Let's, it, stick, let's stick to the rules, let, let, Let's, let let, let's go back to only media. only media. I don't want to be accused of anything. Because we've laid the rules ahead of the debate. So let's stick to that. Only media. I think, Keba, you would recognize everybody from a media so, house. So media houses are going to ask again. Is that, is that possible? Well, if, if a fresh hand is not up. <laughs> if a fresh hand is not up. Are there some fresh hands that didn't ask before? If not, then we'll go back. Can you please stand up? We're not seeing the person. Yes. Please. Good evening, everyone. My name is Fatu Samba. I work for the Gambian Talents TV. And my question goes to Honorable Salah. A lot of people say you are generally angry, and that is why you are responding to every single question that people talk about you. Some people say you are childish to respond to every individual who says everything about you, including ordinary Gambians and that will delay your process. A leader, let's talk the talk, walk the walk, whilst others talk. What is your response to those who believe that Halifa Salah, when elected into office, will be busy responding to every Gambian comments made against him instead of walking? Well, I, believe I that think that you is, said two questions. I think that is what uh, democracy okay, is Okay, let, let's go, let, let, let him respond. And then you may ask Dr. Ismaila directly, right after his response. If leaders are not responsive to the questions of those people they lead, I don't know what type of leaders they are. If they think that they are above the people who elect them, I don't know what type of leaders they are. If those who are led believe that their leaders are above them and they should not raise questions and debate with them, I don't know what type of people we have. We are building a sovereign 
country with a sovereign people. People who know that leaders are not rulers. They are servants of the people. And they must answer to their every question so that they are clear on who they are supporting and for what. So those people who make those statements are entitled to them. I do not argue with opinions. I respect them. Our second question for doctor. All right, uh, Dr. Ismaila, um, the question is, um, you made 10 promises recently to the Gambians, and this is uh, what you said. Um, how, how do you intend to fulfill this agreement? President Barro and the coalition, some coalition government officials or some coalition members uh, made several promises to Gambians, and they did not fulfill uh, I, it. I, I think he knows there are 10 points. Yes. So we want to know whether he will just make promises just like anybody and without fulfilling it. They said three years, and the three years is not fulfilled. Well, I will not make ten promises. If I know, I cannot fulfill ten promises. If I had known that I can only fulfill one promise, I would have made only one promise. Because I know I can fulfill the ten promises. That is why I made ten promises. Thank you. Media House. Journalist. I, I, I can continue here. We have about, we've gone about uh, just under 90 minutes. And uh, for fair play, um, I have a question here. Maybe I'll, I'll go with you, uh, Honorable Sal. And the question really sent to me, I don't want to name a person, but it said, would you consider the 2016 coalition agreement as a good model for future alliances with political parties? Well, the model was based on a challenge that there was no level ground for multi-party contest. There is no second round of voting. If you have constitutional reform where you have second round of voting, well, it means that all parties will be able to participate and then coalitions can be built on the basis of who is the front runner after a, 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 an election. But where you do not have a level ground and the incumbent is becoming more and more entrenched, then of course, coalition 2016 would be a model. But where you have a second round of voting, that would not be the case. But in the instance of the Gambia, we must accept that regime change is not enough for the vast majority of people. What people really want is an end to their suffering. So it means that the type of coalition that could be formed must be coalition that will lead to a system change, that will lead to addressing the needs of the people. Thank you, Honorable. Uh, Dr. Ismaila, um, one of the cardinal and central um, components of the coalition 2016 is civil service reform. What are your views on it uh, so far, four years in? Well, the civil service reform wasn't even initiated yet because we still have the same bloated, inefficient civil service. So no reform took place in that front. And that is why if you look at our 10-point plan, uh, number one, we are promising to diversify the economy to make sure that there is growth provide jobs, reform the civil service and state-owned enterprises, and eradicate corruption. So we take civil service reform very seriously. We need to motivate and bring incentives. We need to set standards within the civil service. We need to ensure we digitize the civil service so it is more efficient, uh, so that people are sad. The civil service is supposed to serve the public. That is why they call it the civil service. But for now, it is failing in that front. And we need to reinvigorate and revitalize the civil service so that it is fit for purpose. Honorable Salah, um, somebody just texted me now to say, if you say that regime change is not enough, are you in fact not agreeing with Dr. Cesar's position? I believe we have agreed in one instance where he said that the type of alliance that should be built for 2021 must be aimed at changing a system. I don't know whether the person questioning 
uh, is tilting towards that. But if it is simply saying that I was maybe implying that there was system change in 2016, uh, that there was that you agree that regime change is not enough well, now are you in fact then agreeing with dr c i don't know whether it's agreeing but i think i have declared this since 2017 that there has been regime change and it's not enough so i don't think i'm stating anything new i'm stating what i have always stated that regime change is not enough but in the circumstances it was the only thing that could move Gambia to the next level. Without it, we would have been elsewhere. Dr. Ismail Assise, is it fair to say that Coalition 2016 is a complete failure, given that without the Coalition 2016, Jame would still be in power? Well, I think we need to understand that Jame being in power is not the issue. It's about changing Jame and bringing someone who will do things differently, who will change and transform the country that Jame did not do. As we speak, we are going for elections in a couple of months' time. We still don't have term limits in the Constitution, and that was why we are calling for electoral reforms. There is still no 50 plus one. We're still going for simple majority. That is why we are calling for electoral reforms. The diaspora will not vote. That is what we are calling for electoral reforms. So, and the Honorable had said that if you go to the market, people are suffering in this country. So what has changed? What's ha what has regime change brought to Gambia? Apart from the fact that, yes, we'll come here and speak our minds and debate without the NIA taking us to Bambadinka. Now, you may ask, uh, Flex, we will come to you. Uh, I think Flex wants a question. Uh, but you may ask each other a direct question. Honorable Salah? Would you have a question that you want clarity on, based on his... Yes, uh, I was surprised when he said that the civil service is bloated, meaning that the objective is to reduce it, because what I have seen is that we do not even have the type of civil service that can currently address the challenges. Look at the hospitals. How many doctors, how many nurses? Look at the number of qualified teachers. Uh, look at the number of... I don't think we have enough people who should render service. And the type of economy he's talking about, it leads to contraction, economic contraction. And it leads to retrenchment of, 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 of civil servants because you are not building the productive base. Where will he get the money to run an enlarged civil service? He does not know where to get it. And that is why what they are recommending is to retrench, feel that the civil service is gloated, so you must actually reduce it. Is that and not his like position? When I say it is bloated, I mean it is overstaffed, and that we need to streamline the civil service and do what they call RRR. We retrench, we retrain, and we reintegrate. Because now what's happening within the civil service, we still have people called messengers in the civil service. We still have drivers in the civil service. We need to reform it so that some of the services that the civil service need, especially in the offices, can be served by the private sector. Why have the paramilitary guarding the public installations and not giving it to private security firms? Why have the civil government employing people to clean offices and not outsourcing it to private cleaning firms? This creates jobs and it also helps formalize the very large informal economy. So my argument is that the civil service is too big. It is not fit for purpose. We need to find a way to streamline it to make it more effective by also bringing what they call a confluence of the civil service and technology to bring more efficiency. Does that answer the question? Well, it I'm, I'm in fact wondering. Uh, the issue he mentioned is that you will retrench, retrain, and then Put them back there so no, it means that reintegrate means that um take them to other places where they can be more productive so the problem is not is because it's big is because they are not trained you, you believe that you need for the training for, for clarity are we talking about quantity or quality that is I, what I, i'm saying i, I think yes, that's uh, the issue let's find a convergence here. yes that's what he's if it's bloated is are you saying is so many incompetent people not incompetent so but, but some people who don't are not serving any purpose in the civil service 
must be removed from the civil service and they train for other sectors. There are other sectors that need people. Today, as we speak, uh, in our 10 point plan, we made a pledge that we are going to provide 100,000 jobs within five years. Now, the Gambia, Gambia has the potential to tap the power of the services sector. If you look at the Gambia's position, it is strategically located, similar to Djibouti in the, along the Red Sea, just that Djibouti is inside Ethiopia, and today they are one of the most vibrant maritime service industries. Now, Gambia, today we have what we can bring innovative solutions and new products to really increase tourist arrivals from roughly 200,000 to is, a million tourists. Is, is your issue here about quality at the same time? We need and the numbers, the both of them. We need quality. So that we need to train one. and equip and qualify. Of course. So they, because it's and then to serve also the cut the numbers down and send a lot of people but to the private sector. But that is why sector. we are saying civil service reform. Is Does that answer your question, Honorable? Overall. In fact, I'm getting more and more confused because what I'm beginning to question is whether really the plan is to eradicate poverty in the Gambia. What I am beginning to hear is increasing really. The, if you look at the pay that the civil servants are receiving now, and you look at the package, and with that you believe that you are going to reduce and you expect that you are saving something that will facilitate greater development. But the purpose of reduction is not to save. Uh, the purpose let, of let, reduction. let him complete. Let him complete, sir. Right. Let him complete. Come, go ahead, sir. So essentially, what I'm being told is that there is no answer to the poverty of the, of the country. And if that is added to the whole issue that you are bringing a free market, where is the free market in the Gambia? For 56 years, every government aimed to build a free market. How many people are actually earning to have business in this country that can employ the type of population that he's talking about? Where is the free market in the Gambia? Can I ask a question to the Honorable? Yes. You, know, you, you may answer. You may answer. Where is the free market? The free market is existing. It's just that its potential has not been maximized because the enabling environment was not created by the government, but by previous governments. We did not build human capital, which is a prerequisite to have a vibrant free market system that brings in wealth. We did not build the, re, the, 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 the relevant infrastructure, which is a prerequisite. We did not also get the right legal frameworks to fight corruption so that investors can have confidence in the market and bring in global wealth. So you don't blame the free market for that. You blame the ineffective, corrupt, and inefficient governments for that and not the free market itself. So where will these people invest when they come? Do you see the land? Are they going to invest in land? Well, there are many sectors. Investors Like, decide like which sector, for example? Services sector in the agricultural sector. Service, you already Maybe have Africa, Shell, you have all these but the services telecommunication systems. That is communication. Give us, that give is us. tourism. Let's that is tech. allow him to respond. Yeah. That on. is tourism. That is tech. That is banking. That is insurance. So the service sector is not about telecommunications. You see, the service sector is a sector which employs very few because of high tech. Any efficient service sector will not be talking about increasing employment. It's not a sector that employs. It's a sector that relies on technology. It replaces human beings. That is the reality. So the service sector is necessary. The private sector is necessary. But the private sector in this country cannot grow to a level where you can have eradication of poverty. The difference between Gambia and Sweden and Norway, etc., you had a private sector that blossomed to a point that you can tax the private sector in order to provide for those who are not employed, in order to provide for those who have more children, in order to provide those who are all elderly, so you can provide social welfare. But the difference between those countries and this country is that we do not have a private sector to tax because they are already overtaxed. And you cannot do anything to that private sector to be able to provide what you need to, 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 to deal with poverty. So what we are saying is that yes, you have consumption-based welfare for countries that have big private sector to tax, but you must have production-based welfare for countries that do not have that. And that's why you must have a cooperative bank in order to provide that resource that the farmer needs, farming implement, fertilizer, 
Thank so you, that they will you. be able to. That's, that's, that's the time. What, 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 what do you want to do? Doctor, doctor, we'll give you two minutes uh -huh. to uh, respond. I have a, but I have, to, I have yeah, a question. We'll give you two minutes to respond. Uh -huh. So we conclude this. Uh -huh. Then your question to him. Yeah, two okay. minutes to okay. respond, okay. No, then you ask your but question. No, but he owes me a question. He asks me a question and I answer. No, no, that's what I mean. Yeah. All you right, okay, you, you will take two minutes now mm -hmm. so that we'll conclude this point yeah. and then can you I, ask can him I a direct ask a question. question in my two minutes? No, no, no. After minutes, your two minutes, I'll you can ask question. him a direct question. All right, that's fine. Yes. Um, what I'm trying to say is that um, the system that he's talking about, that Doi is talking about as a Nigonga, has been tried elsewhere and it has failed. I think the system that they are saying is a repackaged communism, communism of the 21st century. It cannot work, it has not worked, it has failed. Countries that are able to transform their societies within a very short period of time relied on the expansion of the private sector and attracting global capital. The Rwandas, the South Africans, after apartheid, Mandela himself, who at once was very left-wing leaning, in fact befriending Fidel Castro, when he became president, he changed course and started um, orienting South Africa towards private sector-led growth. Even China, why did, how did they really fight poverty and eradicate, not eradicate, but fight poverty and bringing hundreds of millions of people out of poverty within a very short period of time is because they were able to learn the wisdom that too much government, central planning has been tried and it has failed in Cuba, it has failed in North Korea, it has failed in the Soviet Union, it has failed and failed and failed and it did not work. And my question is, can the Honorable tell me one country where the cooperative system was used and poverty was eradicated within a very short period of time? The country where he studied, the country where he lived, the country that educated him, today no way has what you call sovereign national wealth. The oil money of sovereign uh, Norway, the oil money of Norway is why poverty is eradicated in Norway, because that money is sovereign national wealth. That is what is meant by sovereign national wealth. The type of logic that you have is not based on fact. It's based on fiction. Because if you look at the countries you have mentioned, where the Soviet Union, all these countries, those countries are still prospering to a certain degree based on the because conditions, from communism to based on the foundations no, they have please, established. Please allow him. Because right. based on the foundations they have established. And now those foundations had failed in certain respects, and as a result, you can see the impact. But it is very clear that whether in the Middle East, in the Arab countries, whether in Norway, other countries, in the Scandinavian countries, sovereign national wealth is the basis of eradication of poverty in this world. Whether in China, all the countries, whether in Rwanda, any country that you have mentioned, anywhere you do not have sovereign national wealth, it is not possible to sustain development. That is the emphasis. And what you are saying, you are just name calling. We are saying from the ocean, how many vessels could we have put in the ocean by now? How many licensed vessels do we have? How much have they paid? How many have we captured and taken to the bank, uh, to, the, to the courts? All that, you could have bought fishing vessels and they would have been plying our waters and bringing resources to the nation and putting it in a bank and the cooperative banking system would have taken root and you would have been sending our children from GTTI into the productive base. From the farm into the productive base. Women from the garden into the productive base. That is the way of the future. Nobody is saying exclude a private sector. The private sector has its place in Thank order you. to take money from the banking system in order to, to invest your last in the productive minutes? base. Yes, let me borrow my... Yes, the private sector... At this moment, 1.6 billion, which is almost over 60 something thousand million dollars, is actually what is traded in foreign currency in our banking system. But where is it in our productive base? That is the role of the private sector. Government has no role in owning, for example, a hotel, Ocean Bay Hotel, and all this owned by Social Security. That's not the purpose of government. 
that should go into the hands of the private sector. That's where the private sector should, 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 should invest. But the land that our people own, you give it to foreign investors to take over your land, employ your women to go and work there for pittance, and they export and make billions. Is that the type of system he's talking about? We are saying if Doi was in charge of this country, not a single land will be sold by the government. Everything will go in the hands of the Gambian people in terms of ensuring that the Gambian people work for their development. That's what we are talking about. The gardens in Kafuta, etc., should be owned by our own people. And the cooperative bank will assist them to be able to get the resources to be able to produce. Thank you. That's what we are talking about. Uh, doctor, yeah, is, it, is your question actually answered? Yes, but also is your question because, answered? Because, I, because I, I, got, I got confused. Um, <laughs> because it's, the, 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 the system is so vague that I got confused. Because why? Because Norway did not build their sovereign wealth through a centrally planned cooperative system, but by uh, tapping into the, the, uh, their oil, oil industries. And Sweden did not build their sovereign wealth through a centrally planned um, cooperative system, but by having what they call the mixed economy, where the state allows free enterprise and innovation and ingenuity, but also the state also comes in to ensure that the market is regulated. But also when it comes to labor, uh, Honorable mentioned that we cannot allow our people to be exploited and pay less than the value of their labor because investors are coming. That depends on the government in power. Once a serious government put the right regulatory frameworks in place, the right laws, the right labor laws, no investor will come. and in and exploit our people, because when you come to invest in the Gambia, you will work within the framework of our laws, environmental laws, our labor laws, but also in a free market economy, economy there's nothing wrong. And nobody's saying that all our land will be owned by foreigners. There are young Gambians who can also invest in the Gambia, own land, own fishing trolleys. Haruna, it has been tried and tried and tried. When governments go into business, they fail, because governments are not good at doing business. They are good at making the right regulatory frameworks so that money is created and that that wealth government uses it through taxes other means to invest it in people, schools, water, electricity, roads, and healthcare. Uh, Anga Basala, you want to react? Uh, how are you getting money from the Saudi fund, Kuwaiti fund, and all these funds in the Middle East? You mean all those investments in oil is owned by private owners outside, or is it really in the hands of the Saudi and other governments? Do you know how those people manage and accumulate wealth? You're saying no way does not accumulate sovereign national wealth. I did not say that. I did not say that. I said they made their sovereign national wealth not through a centrally planned cooperative system, but by rely tapping down their wealth, but their oil resources. Their oil money is going where? It's going to the sovereign world. That's why. That's how they made. That's who why is in control it. of the sovereign wealth? The state. Uh, well, what are you but talking no, about? No, 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 no. What are you talking about? Let's be honest. No, no. It's very clear. What I'm saying is, Saruna. No, what you are saying is not clear. You are trying to. It's about how it is created. That is what the difference is. How is wealth created? Gonga is saying that the world can be created through a cooperative, centrally planned cooperative system. We are saying that we don't believe that. We, be, we don't believe in that. We don't think that that, that, that has succeeded elsewhere. Who wealth say, can be created. Who is saying centrally planned system? Those are your words. Because you want to give an image. <laughs> that, is, that is the image. And let's, let's be open. We are saying currently the central bank is the depository of the consolidated fund of the nation. What is there is tax money, loans and grants. That has not enabled the country to build its productive base. We are saying, if you want to build the roads that you're talking about, the infrastructure you're talking about, where are you going to get the money? That is the fundamental question. There are many ways in which you can get the money. Where? For example, if you create the right environment, you can tap into bonds. You can tap into what? Into, 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 into bonds. Into, for example, if the Gambia had the right framework, the right environment, the diaspora bonds are there. There are private, there is, there is global capital whereby investors can come, there are public-private partnerships to invest in, 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 the, in, the, 
infrastructure uh, sector to build roads and bridges. But also, there is nothing wrong with what America is doing now. Um, today, they are going to invest $500 billion to build roads, to build bridges, to build car charging stations. But these are also, they, got this, they, they are making money from global bonds. So for me, uh, I don't think that we, money should be made through the centrally planned cooperative system, but there is funds out there through the public sector, through trade, through services to make money and this money can be invested in, tech, in, 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 in infrastructure. Okay, the question again. We have the central bank. It depends on tax, grants, and loans. Where are you going to tap money to put in that central bank to build your roads? You are saying float more bonds, have more treasury bills, borrow more. That's what you are saying. If you borrow, you must pay. Of course. How are you going to pay? Where are you going to get the money to pay? But by making sure that you diversify the economy and expand your, your revenue base, because right now our revenue base is contracted. Our agriculture sector is not, is not properly, is the, the potential is not properly tapped. Our ports, our state-owned enterprises are not really bringing dividend to government. So it's not the problem of the central bank, it's about we've not been able to diversify our economy, tap into those sectors that can bring us the funds that we need, like the agricultural sector, it is underperforming. We are doing subsistence farming and seasonal farming. Our tourism sector is not bringing what it's supposed to bring. We are doing seasonal uh, tourism. We have the marine resources, which is not also bringing money. So it's about coming with the right ideas and innovative ideas to make sure that we diversify our economy and make sure that we also tap wealth from other sources through taxation, through ag ag investments in agriculture, investments in services, to bring in money. You are simply saying the same thing again. You are saying loans and loans and loans bonds is nothing no, no. but well what is a what is bond can you explain bond no it's not a, bond see, this is not an economic class well yes it's important no, for no, it no. but what i'm saying is uh, america uh, now uh, for, for clarity for america, for clarity. america now rely on bonds mm -hmm. and what china has simply done to come to gambia establish a state construction company during jawara's time mm -hmm. Build your state house, mm -hmm. build the Supreme Court building, mm -hmm. build your stadium, mm -hmm. you pay, they deposit it in the bank in, in, in Britain or, or US, and generate resources from that, and then invest in the American bond market, because America is a country of last resort, where all these people will deposit their money, and the American government can rely on bonds to be able to provide infrastructure. But we are talking about Gambia. We are talking about Gambia, not America. So the issue here is, where are you going to get tap the resources other than loans? You are talking about bond, it's nothing but loan. Treasury bill is loan from government, it's domestic through, borrowing. Through foreign direct investment, through foreign portfolio investments. This can happen in the Gambia, and it's happening because the Gambia today, our FDI is very small because we did not create the right environment. Other countries are tapping into FDI. That is why I said that we live in a in a highly highly um, hyper global uh, hyper, in a hyper economy, and countries that are able to create the right environment to attract global wealth, wield it and use it wisely. I will transform very quickly. Okay, let's say you've attracted the global wealth. How, how will it reach it farmer? This will be your, your how will last it reach on this and we'll give him his last and we'll proceed. I, I, think, I think we're rumbling now. How will your global wealth reach the farmer? Well, to provide we, seed is, fertilizer and farming implement to the farmer. Respond, what, what, what we are saying is that we have to move away from the kind of farming we are talking about, giving hosts and fertilizer to farmers. That is a cooperative system whereby you say what? you create a cooperative and give hosts and we are moving, we are going to mechanize. You agriculture. Well, we use machines and new knowledge for agriculture. You, you and this can be only done by attracting foreign direct investment to invest in the agricultural sector. You hear some of them clapping for you? But let, <laughs> let, them, answer, let them answer the question with you. We have farmers now. Without fertilizer, farming implements and seed, you want to mechanize. How will you get that to them? You are going to give it to them free of charge? <laughs> Are you going to sell it to them? Well, that is the difference is that we can... How will you do that? Well, I mean, your question is vague. It's what not vague. It's very vague. How will you get resources to the farmer to that produce? Is, that is not to the farmer to... And if anybody wants to get into agriculture, Gen what gentlemen. we do is to provide access to finance to do agriculture. Access we to finance. people money and, and, and farming. Oh, no, no, no. May, may we Please bring this go house go. in order? Let's bring the house in order, gentlemen. House in order. House in order. House in order.
Honorable Salah, a question for you from Mohammed Tex Teyanki Kanyi, I think. It says, there is no doubt that Coalition 2016 registered a number of successes, which includes regime change. However, should and can any individual partner of Coalition 2016, in this case PDOIS, take glory of uttering those successes while abdicating responsibility for the failures? If yes, why? If no, why? I've said that Coalition 2016 developed in stages. The first stage of ensuring peaceful transfer of power is what we participated in. That's obvious to everybody. The second phase of the executive assuming office and formulating policies and implementing them, we are not a part of that. Pure and simple. And that is the phase that people are criticizing. But we are not part of that. We did not abdicate responsibility because I've said that we even struggle to assess so that we can have an agency for sustainable socioeconomic development. We would have tapped all the expertise in the country. But that had not actually happened. So essentially then, what is happening is the executive implementing its policies. That's why we are not taking responsibility for that. Dr. Ismaila, the, the same uh, from Mohammed Tex. Like you, I am a firm believer of the principles of collective responsibility in a group's commissions and omissions during the course of executing its responsibilities. Differently, in further dissecting the course or courses of a problem for meaningful lessons to be learned, recognized, recognition must be made on who championed the failures that have been registered for the purposes of self-evaluation. In the case of Coalition 2016, who do you think should be the champion and why? The champion for what? Failures of Coalition 2016. Well, I wouldn't call them champion of failures. I wouldn't call them champion of failures. What I, would, what I have always said I'm agreeing is that the coalition had two objectives, strategic objectives, as in explicitly written in the, in the coalition agreement, that one is to effect regime change through peaceful means, and second, create the enabling environment to have elections in a level playing field. They succeeded in one, effecting regime change, but the second one did not happen. So I wouldn't call them champions of failure. I would say that there were weaknesses, there were failures, and the agenda that was promised did not come to fruition. Now, uh, I'll ask this question to you. Uh, a senior journalist person just texted me this to say, want both of you to answer this question, by the way, but we'll start with Honorable. Says, uh, you both have very interesting ideas, but will you be willing to work together on behalf of the Gambian people? That is DOI and Citizens Alliance. Honorable Salah? Well, we have said that all forces that are interested in system change must work together to save the Gambia. That's what we have said. It is left for Citizen Alliance to define itself. But for us, we want to eradicate poverty. We want to eradicate injustice. We want to eradicate ignorance. How to get wealth to that poor farmer to eradicate the poverty of that farmer, to that young student finishing school at GTTI to come and have a productive base to work. That woman who wants to sell does not have any means to do so. How to get wealth to that person so that they can produce is fundamentally our objective. This is not centrally planned. It is not talking about the state owning the land. It is saying the people owning the land is to give fertilizer seed farming implements to those people. It is saying that that person who owns the milling machine is a person owning the milling machine and processing. That person owning the shop is the person owning the shop and using it to sell to earn an income. That is what we are talking about. That a state like Gambia, you need a cooperative financial system that will not charge interest on that farmer, interest on that uh, person, young person coming from, from school, 
interest on that woman who wished to sell. Interest will disappear. What is important is a revolving fund to make those people productive. If CA definitely is uh, seeing Gambia in that light, well, obviously, uh, we are evolving to become partners. The other elements of the private sector, there is no country in this world that will not encourage a private sector. What Doi is in fact saying is that the private sector in the Gambia should be linked to the private sector of Africa so that we can build up the base rather than waiting for oil companies from other lands to come and invest in our oil resources. South Africa may have the potential, Egypt may have, all these countries may have the potential to be able to come up to an African investment bank come up to an African investment bank to build the companies that will be able to harness our resources. This is what we are talking about. Thank you, Dr. I think that's a point of convergence of agenda between DOI and CA. And what is that? That we need to ensure we make the right policy, social policy investment so our people can live in dignity. So our young people can have jobs, decent jobs that pay so they can live in their country in, 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 in dignity, so that our hospitals are well staffed and well equipped, and there is health care where you are scheme, where every government who needs medical care gets it affordable, so that there is enough electricity, there is enough water for our people, so they don't have to drink uh, well water or fetch water, but in their own homes. So there is um, the basics, that's what we want. Now, how we go about it, how we create the world to really fund those social projects, that is where there is a bit of a difference. But I don't think the differences are so rigid that we are not able to make a compromise. But like I said, it's politics. Um, what is important is that the agenda is right, the framework is right, and it can bring sustainable development and transformation to this country. We can work with any party that has that agenda. We, 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 we would have closing statements by both, five, five minutes. We will also let uh, both of you choose a language of your choice to make a, uh, some sort of a summary of the discussion and your ideas. And you may choose Wolof or Mandinka for both of you. But before we get to that, um, there's so many questions are coming in. But uh, let us please remind everyone, this is a beginning. We cannot exhaust everything in a single debate. So we will therefore will have to bring this to an end sooner or later. They have been standing for two hours, and definitely uh, we cannot be here all night. But uh, Honorable Salah, I'll start with you. Um, this one says there is a pool of educated Gambians everywhere in the world. Would you, as a president, as a presidential candidate, as a political party, consider tapping into that wealth of knowledge for growth for Gambia? Well, that's precisely so. That is what was recommended to this government, to create an agency for sustainable social economic development, to create an expert bank. We have emphasized that, that we must create an expert bank, create a database for every Gambian who has something to contribute to be featured in that database. They will be the people that you can put together to develop your public sector, to develop your private sector, to develop your cooperative sector, to develop your informal sector. These four sectors must be developed in any economy in developing countries before you can eradicate poverty. And our people do not only have the capacity in terms of technical knowledge, but they may also have the financial resources to invest. So you must be able to pool them together and pool them so that strategically you can take them to the sectors where they can invest and facilitate the productive development of our economy. Doctor, same question. Yes, of course. We believe that the diaspora has the power uh, in terms of knowledge and world. And within C, one of our vision is to tap into that wealth and power. Therefore, when the current government went to Brussels uh, to attend the so-called donor, uh, donors conference to get money, I think it should have also been accompanied with uh, 
brain conference to also attract Gambians who are working abroad in very different institutions, in very many different sectors and fields with big expertise to come and help build this country. So we're open to that. Uh, last question, really, I'll have to bring this to an end uh, sooner. Um, the inequality in the Gambia is so apparent, Honorable Salah, particularly between rural and urban Gambia. What would you do to bring about uh, development to Gambians and some sort of equality? Well, we have mentioned that there is no single village where you will find sovereign wealth. Every village is dependent. And they can be productive sectors where if you have a, a, a land that can be the village land, the cooperative bank will give them seed fertilizer farming implement to produce and it goes into the village treasury for the buying of milling machines, etc. If they have a, a sort of a pond, you can transform it into aquaculture so that they can and and put it in the village treasury for the provision of the things that you need, infrastructure that you need in the village. The village as a productive unit provided funds by the cooperative bank will enable each family farm to earn enough to be able to invest in infrastructure in proper housing in the village setup so that you will have housing schemes that will be devoted to the villages and consequently that will upgrade the development of the villages. Not only that, look at what is happening in Katong, Patakong, Kusanyang. You are mining, but there is no percentage that is retained for the village. You must have a memorandum of understanding and an agreement that will ensure that a given percentage will go to the village. Royalties will be paid by all the Nawek poles, Gamtel poles, and other poles that you put in villages to be able to sell electricity, sell uh, uh, credit, in order to ensure that each village has earning capacity to be able to provide the services that the village needs. So there is absolutely no doubt that the law of balanced and proportionate development must be implemented to the full, where the urban area will develop side by side with the rural area. That's why we're talking about the civil service reform is to augment salary on the basis of the quantity and quality of work done. But you can only do that by enhancing the earning of sovereign national wealth. Thank and you. if you do that, then the housing system, you can have civil servants having built Thank you. housing system for them, they can be earning and paying to own the houses. That's how we intend to, to change the social... How family. do you address inequality? Just to pick up from him, yes, enhance sovereign national wealth, even though maybe perhaps differently, and invest it in uh, social projects. For example, one of the reasons why there is so much inequality today is because there are no equal opportunities in this country. Education, there is no equality in education. Educational provision and access, if yes, there's no quality, it's, also, it's not also equal. Uh, it means that a child born in Kololi gets access to more quality education than a child born in, in, in Kolior. So we're going to make sure that we really have interventions that can ensure that every child born in this country has equal opportunities by investing in quality education for every part of this country and also by coming up with uh, interventions to really remove or to make to blow to some extent the rural urban dichotomy by reversing uh, development by coming up with housing projects in like which will be in the rural areas, making sure that young people have jobs by providing skills training and building their capacities. Because once you provide people with jobs and they are paid well, you increase standards of living. When you increase standards of living, you build a bigger middle class. Wealth is created more, and then that wealth is invested back into the people. And in the long to short to medium term, you don't eradicate equality totally. Only grow by the exchange of ideas. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. Our politics will not change if you continue drumming Saurba and Barama Sending and eating Benachin. It's the battle of ideas, it's policies, it's engaging with the public that will bring the change that we desire. A lot of young people have been registered this year. I am very proud that a lot of young people are now taking part in the process. We have to take responsibility 
We have to own our country, and I think our young people need to be majorly commended for that. I've seen a lot, a lot, a lot registering. Now, Honorable Salah, you have five minutes. You can make points, you can make emphasis, you can make closing statement in English. On the, on the 21st of January, the former president left the country. But on the 20th, not a single soul was in the street. The country was a desert, hanging on the balance of probability. I remember going to where President Barrow resides, and we were anticipating anything on that day because it was the final day. Either a comic will come by force and bombs would have destroyed the state house and the bunkers that are there would explode, the hospital close by, the whole of Banjo would have been in flame. And it is now incredible that at that material time, many Gambians were calling for that to happen, not knowing what the implications would be. But we kept a steady course, guided economy, ensured that the security forces in the country were united under the president, under the republic, to facilitate the entry of economic as a solidarity force rather than a force of intervention. That is how Gambia welcomed President Adam Abaro at the airport and thousands, tens of thousands of people celebrated his coming and took him to his residence. We achieved that as a Gambian people. The next phase is for us to remain united, to know that our enemy now is poverty. Our enemy now is ignorance. Our enemy now is injustice. We are capable of putting that to an end. We are going to die. What legacy are we going to leave behind for our children and children's children? Are we going to continue to clap for politicians because of words? Or are we going to listen very carefully, thoughtfully, to gather ideas that will enable us to make informed choice? What is the purpose of this discourse? It is to help each of us to take ownership of our minds, to know that we are sovereign, to know that we own this country. And because we are sovereign, we are the decision makers. And therefore, this country will sink if we don't think and take the right decisions. It will float if we think and make the right decisions. This is the starting point of the battle of ideas. It must not be seen as battle of individuals. Ideas can be exchanged. I heard Dr. Sisse mention sovereign national wealth. Two minutes, sir. I believe that is what they also wish to rely on to fight poverty. I don't see how we can fight poverty in any other way through loans, grants, and taxes. We must harness our sovereign national wealth that belongs to all the people. The question is, how are we going to distribute it to be able to eradicate poverty? The debate will continue on that score. Be before I give Dr. Cesar the floor, I'd like to thank very much iAfrica TV for partnering with us here today and providing the screen. 
I'd like to also thank uh, Gambia Music Store for providing the sound system and the lights. I'd like to thank uh, Kid Fatu, Fatu Network, Gambia Talents, Guy Nako, and all of the media here today. This is, in fact, our debate. This, in fact, is the new beginning. And the only winners today is the Gambian media and the Gambian public. Dr. Cesar, five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Haruna. Our people have suffered for far too long. Since gaining independence in 1965 from Great Britain, we have not been able to build a country where every Gambian citizen will live a dignified life. We are not able to feed our people. We are not able to care our people when they are sick. We are not able to give our children quality, relevant education where they can have mastery and compete in the global stage. We are not even able to give our people clean water, let alone clean or cheap electricity. We are not able to build good roads. We have not done anything for ourselves. The time has come for us to change and transform this country. I agree with Honorable that we need to unite. The Mandinka is not the enemy of the Wolof. The Fula is not the enemy of the Jola. Do is not the enemy of CA. UDP is not the enemy of NPP. The Christian is not the enemy of the Muslim. We have a common enemy, all of us. Whether you are Doi, whether you are CA, whether you are Manjago or Mandinka, whether you are a Christian or Muslim, whether you are a nationalist, a communist, whether you are a, a monarchist, we all have a common enemy in this country. We've not been able to fight and win against this common enemy because we've not been united. And our differences have always been out there. Where is that common enemy? Poverty. Disease. Bad roads. Lack of education. And until we unite, this enemy will stay and it will defeat us. In 1965, Gambians made a very difficult decision whether to vote and leave the British Empire or to stay within the orbit of the British Empire. Nobody believed in the potential of the Gambia to exist as an independent nation. They said it was not a viable country. And in fact, it was called the birth of an improbable nation. Yet, we persisted, we made it. We gained independence. We were, we were tested in 1981, we made it. In 94, we were tested again, we made it, and in 2016. We are more hopeful that if we can vote to get independence in 1965, under difficult circumstances, and vote to bring democracy and the rule of law in 2016 under difficult circumstances, I see no reason why we cannot go back to the polls in 2021 and vote to bring development to this country. Because our independence and democracy is meaningless if it is not accompanied by development. Now is the time for us to put our differences aside and work for this country. It takes one generation to build the country for the next generation. We have to build the country for the next generation. It is projected that we will be 5 million people in 2050. To build a country for 5 million people starts now. What jobs will be created for them? What jobs will exist in 2050? What kind of roads do we want to build in 2050? How much energy do we need and how do we generate that energy in 2050? How do we ensure in 2050 where there is energy security? There is food security? There are global challenges, climate change. We all see what's happening. How do we bring climate resilient societies? How do we adapt to climate, climate change and build a country so the next generation that will come will come and find a country where they can live in dignity and not make a decision to die at sea and stay in their country. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Adam, I saw you dozing there for a minute. I was wondering what happened to the sound. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'm glad we're here. 
Uh, one of our sponsors is the Forbes Academy. If any of us here are wondering why and how these two honorable gentlemen are able to deliver such powerful speeches and arguments in public speaking. You ought to see uh, Pastor Forbes, and he is a wonderful trainer in public speaking. He's one of our sponsors tonight. Honorable Salah, you have five minutes. Mandinka, Manjago, Jola, Wolof, but any local language to address the general public on any points you wish. Uh, it could be on Coalition 2016, or it could be addressing a general point that the public needs to be aware of. Five minutes, sir. Bankuding Yamu Kamolet Bankuding Yamu Sembolet Kango Nin Sembo Naman Taratuntending Londoleka Fahamuraleka Akatina Ronat Meng Ye Gambia Batandi wala mu balangot ka tonya je nyaala ye balam ya soso ye dung din kokon wala ya kendi mol meta ka wulu bata kono ka mem bata kono ka keba ya bata kono ka fa bata kono kele dindi ngol tu bata kono ye mem bata kono keba bata kono fa bata kono mamare gol wonyo ila bal wala nafale wole nyan na barna ate ban nola londo ko ate ban nola tonya ko ate bang nola kambe ngo ko ma banko wuluta wole kam pour nga ke kilint gambia di ngol be ye ke kilint kilin mam fes ya kilint bawo kilin ngo kilin karte ke se kilin wole be ko e ko wole karfa pour le président au tombo ya karfa pour que député tombo cancel au tombo wala mu toñat woto ndel be le ñanta sila ka crosser ok mu silo le ñanta tamala pour que foire ya bay mu silo le ñanta tamala pour que tilimbal ya bay mu silo le ñanta tamala pour que fahamu bal ya bay ni nga wo silo le ndoro la tamala ndoro yirwo be sabatila dahabe sabatila mo beba da hala nyim bankoka al nimbar liñu woné moy né pour nek doomi rew lamu laaj moy baat doomi rew ya baat la doomi rew ya doole la doole bo xamné sun jitalul xel mu nek neen ñun ñep xamnañ né dole ak bat soko werul ci deug mu nek ne soko werul ci xam xam mu nek ne soko werul ci and mu nek ne bon nak ñun doomi gambia dañu wara and top deug sakku xam xam pour xam deug gi suñu deful lolu dinañ continuer di juddu ci ciono di magge ci ciono di magge ci ciono di te ci ciono dom ci ciono de ci ciono set ci ciono de ci ciono lim laaj moy ñu xamne ñun ño mom rew ni xeet go muna joge diine go muna joge fo muna joge fek domi gambie nga ya ñepp ya mu mel nak emo bobu limu laaj moy bole suñu dole yi wane fok ñu jital suñu xel yi bon nak suñu togim ci rew mi tay limu laaj ku nek ci ñun laaj bop ban yoon lañ wara jaar pour dak ndol dak ciono dak reer dak notel suñu deme bi gis yoon wowu ñu jaar ci rek ciono jeexna ndol jeexna notel jeexna reer jeexna ñu mëna tedd ci kaw suuf nit lolu la mom rap mom mom juddu ci ciono be de ci ciono nit moy ñaka tedd lool lañu mom nañ aw ci yoni nit ñun ñep ñu mëna mucc jër leen jëf ci deglu jëneral jëf jëre jëf honorable sala docteur ismaila manjago jola serir olof 5 minutes 
Baraka baake haruna mbe tentula mbe jaila e kato minke kaje ko nyin kacha e soto nyin kacha do muna ya sabu muna daliloti ron pour nga na jang kacha nga jube mbe banko mba tamandila nyadile banko la na flo mba do ko la nyadile ni nga do ko nga ke banko dingol kan pour ka bata bay e sa banko di o banko ding e si sabatino gambia banko kan foro ya kono ani horomo kono ani bunya kono gambari ngom meta batala ka bari ngam fang soto fo sañ muka ku kenom faye na molla jol man si ikara saate dolte mol man jio soto la sul kono gi sene ngotije mol man kurango soto le pitanol man soto silul man bete ya sañi lulu o sañi lulu o molla ka kartel faye sene lal batala la seno mena fa fonding kel man do ko soto bari sañi lulu o sañi lulu kana karte tan ka fay oto meta karte fay wala ba ni la karte mi na fa ba mi alon ko wala ka jio sabab ji senango anin kurango anin lapitanol anin sila kendol anin do ko pour funding kel karte le ka wo sabab oto nin karte ma wo finang oto na karte fayo hani kabi aman na fa soto oto sañ wato sitale pour nga kuning nga nyayele nga na moy politician la mi alon ko wala si ferol fenam ferol mialon ko wala si gambe bondi batako no balu dai sone ya fonding ke do ko soto momo sasa re se jare be daming ndingole karang karang mialon ka abete atale isaje asina fa o wato le kana siteng me o soka nyadi le na kambeng na si fatam fanso bayi fatam fanso fatam fanso nga bayi o do ne si karo sabatino gambe bankun kan on me mo be tentu la mbal jayla ka foko nimu katadi kata mialon ka kuma da bake a ni monara bi ako ali akarafa bankola aka nyinin ka ku dantan lalla ako alin karafa la jata kende ala ala balu aldi ngola karango ala silo ba wona fulo min ka doku ani min ka kaje akatara tele bulu woto wato sita ni ngwo monata aya nyinin ka bankola ala nyinin ka ku sabala etolon jumadi ya jiko soto le bang ya balafa soto le bang ya hino soto le bang ni mo soto de banko di lela ni ko radi il munati ne dunta politiko kono pour dun ka banko di ngol na falam bang fo kete fo ngona fa sabanjango il afta ka muneke fere du malle betebul ba politiko mu fero lati nin nin question sabol amari ma jabeno anyama an se wota bake do have another 2 minutes for all of uh, i i think we will we will provide it we you used only one of your 2 minutes so you had an excess 2 minutes you can have it now de des mom bokay di len santa di len gerem di gerem haruna mi nga xamne mom mo wara jotay gi tay jotay bi am solo sax ñew tok fi ñew waxtan ñin mi nga xamne ñu ñe politicien yi bu ko dem ci domiro di ne denka lañ ñu rew ku lañ wax nga denka ko rew nak kan lum la wax moy denka massa dunda sa wergu yaram sa domi sen janga sen yoni ndox ak kurang ak sen karange kon koku bala nga ko den ka rew war nga setat koku moy kan ndax amna jiko ji ndax amna pas pas bi ndax amna ene bi ak yermande bi pour ñu den ka ko rew xam xam mom wa mu dañu laaj wa so ame xam xam nak amulo yermande sam xam amun jeriñ ngam xam xam amulo yar amulo tegin sa xam xam amun jeriñ ngam xam xam amulo yermande sa xam amun jeriñ kon fo ñu sédji ko yoyu non ñu tinka ko ñu xam ndax ki matna den ka rew ñaar bi moy la moy sa pass pass la nga bëgga def la mo tanga duga ci politique pour ñëriñ askan bi la ndax pour ñëriñ sa bopa ñettel bi yaan jéggo nga bëgga jël yaan pexé parce que politique moy pexé pexé lan nak nga liggé comme comme rew mi pour nga jël ko nga def ko ci doomi rew mi pour gis né képp ko am yaang ci bi rew mi sa lepp mot ndaw yi am xey fu ñu xey sen xey ñëriñ lan ku febar ñu mun la fajj fo neka ñep am do bu set bu sella am kurang bu set bu sella te yomba yoon yi bax suñ domi muna janga lu lañ buga bir gambia fi karange am so ne ka sa ker wala ci biti di nga amne kenn du ñu dal sa kaw gañ la wala jël sa alal pour ñu am nak am lolu nak fok ñu bangko neka bena waxna ko fi ci angale te hajala bi bari na surtout ci mbir het du yebu rew fenn dabbe yaaxa rew te jola bi du noni olof bi 
sosé bi du noni sarahul lebi té ñun ñé bénn lé ñoné ka bénn ñoné ka gambia so gëné alof bi gambia gambia né katut gambia da fa dess so gëné bénn hét tamit né katut gambia ko ñuné ka bénn ah wa gis ki ci politique nak muñta né ka bénn waye lu gëna am solo moy bénn gambia lañ gis pour gis né ñu liggéey réew mi su ko défé képp ko xamné yam fi nga di café ci ngor di café ci taranga su booba suñu ndaw yi am xey duñu wax nañu dé ci geej mo leen gënal dal ñu tok syndicat mo di leen jaajé fal di ñaan nak di ñaax né waxtaan gi bu mu fi em ñu ñoo di waxtaan ak askan wi ñu gëna waxtaan ñu xam képp ku nek lam moy sa pexé lam moy sey jéggoy politique lam moy sey gis gis su ba su ko défé ñu mëna taana politicien yo xamné ñu mëna défa réew bi ismaïla ñaar yef nga bolé ñaar yef du doy war nga bolé ab jangalé kat ak politicien lolu foko bolé rek mom wo ho 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 waye di len jajeufal bu baax kontan nañ torop waye nak di dig wa gambia ne li lañ fass ay ne dinañ fexé ñu wo yenen kilifa yu nekk ci yenen parti ñom it ñuy jakkar lo di waxtaan waye waxtaan boba nuñ ko taralé moy ne dañoo xol ne tay de luñu waxtaan moy mbey mi ñu indi ñaar ñu wax seen xel ak xalaat ci lolu buñ joggé ci lolu ñu am benen waxtaan bo xamna kom kom la doon ñu waxtané lolu di wax borom pati yépp nak fukk ak jurom ñetta yi yépp né na ngeen paré nañ fugga seen bunté yi pour ñepp ñew liñ fi daf tay door téla ñepp mënu ñoo bokk ñew fi waxtaan bi num yanjé ni num néxé ni num jaaré yoon ni parce que ñaari nit rek la buñ fi indi won ñaar fukki nit kenn du dégganté lolu motax nak té waxtani tay bi ñom seen bop ñoko sumba man sop moma ci bolé docteur dafa wax waxam wër gejjam gejja bobu nonu keks boko wëri mu ne ko deet woyal say kilifa ma waxtan ak ñom mané ah li ñi gaay di waxtan ni da mom xaara ma dem fofu tok ci digante bi até waye kenn rek mo gagné tay moy gambia té li lañ bëgg li lañ ñamon suñu réew ñuy mëna waxtan ñun yépp kenn du yuxu sa morom kenn du tacc sa morom kenn du saga sa morom té defé na loolu am nañ ko fi tay di len jaajeufal yeen yépp kaadu yi rafet nañ xel yi rafet nañ kon li sax waxtan la won té waxtan bi anda tay yar ak teggen wona ngeen lolu di len ñaanal yeen ñaari kilifa yi tay fi tay ne len ne ah mat gën ay kilifa kilifa ni la def kon dook di len jaajeufal di jaajeufal sen pati yi parce que bu pati yi nangulon xey ña do len fi mëna ñoo tay be ñoo am waxtaan bi di ñaan yeneen pati yi nak da buñ fogé buñte yi nañ nangu ngella bëpp politicien bu nekk ci réew gambia nga ne yow mëno tok jakkar lok sa morom ngeen waxtaan bala kenn sandil carta parce que jamono bobu dañ ko dafa wessu man awma ben intérêt politique bokku ma ci ben political party gambia ma ñor waye gambia bu ñu ñor nak kim ñor ni ñun war nga am sañ sañ ñew jaay sa marchandise ñun doomi gambe ñu jinda sa marchandise lool la ñoo ñaan di len jere jeufal honorable khalifa sall di la wax jere jeuf bu baax di la ñaanal yalla wër ak wër le ak guda fan ñun yeb ñu nga tatan ci yow di jangé ci yow di royé ci yow ma wax len na fi 1995 buñ togué 96 ñune nguuri sordar la ma ngi nek xalé bu ndaw di liggéey radio one american embassy in the ay khalis ndax am xawma won dara sax way ñu tanon mané da nga liggéey ak khalifa sall ak pesen sonko godwin mom la won ñu ñew radio one fm ñuy wax ci referendum bi joggé fofu wax ci constitution bu es bi té lolu luma ci jangé won bari na torop docteur ismaïla sissé mi buma tambalé paradise tv yow la ñeka o na la kay nga tok ak ñun ñuy waxtaan waxtaani politique ndeke yow yang doon ut nguur sa di ut rew bi man xawma ci won dara waye man nak di tatan ci yow di jangé ci yow ñu def suñu cambia politico di eh askan gi 
kon nak yen ñaari kilifa yi ni bo la ñëwé fi ngeen waxtaan ni rek la mëna mel di leen wax jërëjëf sisé di la ñaanal wër ak wër le di la ñaanal guda fan ak nga yaga suñu kanam yeen ñaar ku ci am réew mi and na ñoo yow jërëjëf jëf